Napoleon, the decline and fall of an empire, 1811 to 1821. Accomplished Oxford scholar Michael Brewers delivers a dynamic new history covering the last chapter of the emperor's life from his defeat in Russia and the drama of Waterloo to his final exile as the world he created begins to crumble around him. It is a fascinating subject. Delighted to be joining me live on the line from somewhere in the UK author of Napoleon, The Decline and Fall of an Empire, Michael Burroughs. Michael, good morning to you. Good morning, Giles. Good to have you with us. It is, it's, talk about getting your teeth into something. This is a fascinating period of history and, and, and very rarely does history focus so solely on one man. But for those 10 years, it is, you, you, can, you can chart world history on, on, the, on the French emperor. Absolutely. Um, I mean, this really is um, remarkable because when you look at it from the point of view of contemporaries, all eyes were focused on Napoleon. You know, there was the, all the, the, the Allied leaders, his enemies, you know, the Russian Tsar, um, the British, the Prussians, the Austrians. One focused goal, beat that guy. And, you know, this, this, this is the... You know, the real thing, if you're talking about the great man, you know, one, we've got to beat that guy. And because there he is, uh, you know, in 1811, when the book starts, uh, he looks pretty unassailable, really. You know, everybody's tearing their hair out. What are we going to do with him? Um, and half of the world's looking up to him and half of the world's out to get him. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's an incredible period focused on this bloke. And, uh, you know, where does it all go wrong? And if, if you think about it, I mean, if you look at if we look at this, the the period up to this, Napo- the way that Napoleon has revolutionised the the army, his the French army is the Napoleonic army of France is is formidable. It's well organised. It has some brilliant generals. I know the old saying about "Don't give me a good general, give me a lucky one" is one of Napoleon's famous saying. But he's got Fay etc. as his generals. He is you know they they are they are almost blitzkrieging Europe. They go as far as the Iberian Peninsula, you can call it Peninsula War, the Peninsula War, etc. And then they, they're, they're going to take on the Russians. I mean, it is, it is a, 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 an incredible feat. And, and, and also as far as obviously sort of the, the uh, naval power as well. Yeah, one of the things about Napoleon's army, the Grande Armée, the Great Army calls it, is by the time we get to this period, it's starting to run out of steam. You know, all is not as it appears. That army was forged in remarkable circumstances way back, 10 years before this book starts. Um, Napoleon's planning to invade England, you know, 1801, 18 And he builds this enormous army and bases it, you know, on the Channel Coast because he knows the armies that have fought the wars of the 1790s for the revolution are exhausted. You know, these guys are mostly ready to go home. These Most of this army is built from raw conscripts. But because the invasion never happens, they train and train and train. I mean, these, these poor guys, anyone who's been in the forces will know what I'm talking about. These poor guys didn't just get square bashing. They got almost two years of square bashing. You know, they were hammered out of raw material into something. It shows what a great leader he was. They all had to learn how to swim because it was going to be an amphibious invasion. Even the cavalry and the horse artillery had to learn how to ford rivers. This thing that comes out fighting in 1805, because the Austrians and Russians attack him and he has to cut the invasion short, this is the weapon of mass destruction. This is the thing that blitzkriegs everybody. You know, Austerlitz, you know, that that gets the Austrians and the Russians, you know, Auerstadt gets the Prussians into Lithuania, chasing the Russians again, Friedland, he catches them. This is the era of the great commanders. By the time you get to 1811, that army, the core of it is still there. But, you know, newer conscripts coming in, a lot of soldiers in it who are not French, maybe not committed. And the other thing that, you know, like we mentioned briefly, there's the fighting in Spain, that's drawing off a lot of his good troops and most of his good commanders. You know, when he goes into Russia in 1812, his best generals are not there. Most of them are in Spain. Mm, because I know, that, it, big Russian art, that big army is not being led by his best and bravest. 
It's interesting. Two or three. It's interesting, Two or three. isn't it? Because because the, 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 the we call it the Spanish War, the War of Spanish Independence, or the Peninsula War, as Wellington called it. But that 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 terrain, the terrain that they fight in, isn't isn't made for set piece battles, which is what the Grande Armée is built for. It's it's those, those huge you know cavalry charges, etc. Yeah. Um, and 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 here we have, as I'm I'm sitting to you in Andalusia, but here we have you know we have rugged country, we have, we have ambush, we have hit and run, which is not the fair way of fighting war. Well, it's interesting when you look at Spain, it's a great um, nursery for the army. Uh, Napoleon, after 1812, is continually drawing on good troops from Spain because they learn on the job. Uh, uh, Two things always strike me about Spain. What the French learn is how to fight. Both the French and the British are in a completely new environment. Uh, They learn different lessons, but they learn, and they both become pretty formidable armies. You know, they, they really get their teeth cut mm. on all that, on all that things that you've been talking about, the guerrilla warfare, hand-to-hand, siege warfare, stuff they weren't very good at. Uh, now they are. Cavalry's not much use in Spain. They have to adjust. But what the French never get the hang of is how to supply an army in that tough terrain. They based everything in the early years on what Napoleon called the war of movement. You get out there, you move fast, you travel light, you live off the land. Now, you can do that in rich countryside like you get in Western and Central Europe. You know, it's easy to do in France. It's easy to do in Germany. It's, once you get into Spain, which is much more rugged, as we've said, once, and once you get into Russia, it's barren. You know, there's nothing you can do. And they never get into the way of keeping the army supplied. Whereas the British, Wellington and Beresford in Portugal, they dig themselves in and it all comes in by sea. You know, so it's a very, they're working in a very it's, different it's, world. I, it's interesting, isn't it? It's the whole thing of logistics. And even, and that applies to, that will apply to Hitler's Blitzkrieg in the, in, you know, in, in 39 and, and against the British Expeditionary Force because they eventually wear themselves out. The pills will wear off and the, and the fuel runs out. And the same, you can argue, is, you know, happened a lot with, with Putin when he, we had that, the, the, the tanks outside Kiev. I mean, were they out of fuel or not? It's been a big problem with supply lines. That, that is one of the, the ancient, you know, the, the hard and fast rules. If you want to be hard and fast and well, you've got to make sure that you've got your supplies. Well, you know, I was obviously, as we all were, following what was going on in Ukraine a year ago, almost. Still, We still are. And the 1812 campaign, it was eerie. Napoleon says, right, we've, we've got to go in there supply. Do you know what I mean? There isn't going to be much to live off. We've got to carry our, our kitchen with us. And you've got to learn from Wellington. Got to be organized. Do all this. So they're... He thinks he's well provisioned and they've got these massive, huge supply wagons that need eight horse teams to pull them. You know what happens? They sink in the mud. He didn't think about the fact that there are no proper roads in Russia. (laughs) He goes in in springtime, summertime, summer rains come, the whole thing, they just sink into the mud. You know, the horses, the oxen, they can't pull them. The stuff has to be abandoned. Uh. So his horses... His horses are not destroyed by the Russian winter. That's an urban myth. What happens is the horses, they all go in in spring and summer. The horse's fodder gets too far behind them because the cavalry, you know, just like the Blitzkrieg, just like the Panzer divisions, shoot well ahead of the supplies. There's no fodder for the horses. So they start grazing on green grass that isn't ripe, and they all die of gastroenteritis. Of course. The cavalry's decimated before they even get to Moscow. For the first snow flurry. <laughs> so it's it's not the it's not the Russian that harsh Russian winds that we're, we're led to believe. It's let's just let's just go let's just because eighteen twelve obviously everybody, everybody knows the but um, it is it is the campaign. It's it's seen as overreaching himself. But there are two things to think about here. One is the the fact that the Russians are absolutely going to stop Napoleon, and B. Uh, because he doesn't invade England, uh, that means this British money is still available to, to the rest of the Allies. Is that a fair point? Well, well, actually, 1812 in Russia, the, this business of what the, what the French used to call Pitt's gold, Pitt, the prime minister, you know, Pitt's gold, financing all these coalitions was a myth. 
the the British were remarkably slow or actually um, unreliable about coughing up money. And in 1812, Castlereagh, who was then the British Foreign Secretary, tells the Russians straight from the shoulder. He's the first guy who's ever talked straight to anybody. We're committed to Spain. You know, everything we've got has, has been poured into Spain. Good luck, you guys, but you're on your own. And the czar, Alexander, says, well, I wasn't expecting anything else. You know, you let me down in 185, you let me down in 187. And, you know, he has to go in and face his troops and say, look, fellas, Russia is on its own. So all, all the British managers managed to do was send about 100,000 rifles, which were raised by private muskets, actually, which were raised by private subscription. Right. You know, MPs chipped into the war fund. So when Russia goes in, she goes in alone. But this is it. Once they've kicked Napoleon out, you know, Castlereagh can go back to Parliament and say, look, this is what they did without our help on their own. These guys are worth investing in. And so from about the spring of 1813, the British turn around and say to the Russians and the Prussians, the two countries are still fighting. We'll subsidize you. It starts off, it'll be loans, and then there'll be part loans. And in the end, Castlereagh goes to Parliament and says, look, will you just give him the money? <laughs> You're know, coming back to where we started, Giles. You know, we got to get rid of this guy. Yeah. Just give him the money. Yeah, we'll give him the money. And then they say to the Austrians, look, if you come on board, we'll subsidize you too. Alexander can go to Metternich, who's the Austrian foreign minister, the Austrian chancellor now, and say to him, look, this time they're on the level. Listen to them, they'll pay you. And once Napoleon is faced with the combination of the city of London's finance and the Russian army, the ball is no longer in his court. You know, it's, he's, he's up against a machine bigger than his own. Yeah. And, and at this point as well, Napoleon, of course, is, you know, forget the dashing young Napoleon of, of the earlier campaigns that we, we know of after his first exile. But we're looking here at, at Napoleon, who is who is emperor, who is trying to form a dynasty. And and, you know, as all men who suddenly sort of believe in themselves to be sort of semi divine, Perhaps, um, he, you know, his worldview is getting a bit, a bit, little bit skewered by this and, and other forces are coming into, into his mindset. Well, it's, it's interesting. When I was researching this book and I was reading his correspondence and even more um, the correspondence and the memoirs of guys who were close to him, you know, like uh, Cambers Reyes, who was his um, legal expert and probably the guy who was closest to him really than anybody, um, uh, you know, work-wise, uh, Colin Coeur, who was sometimes his foreign minister, very bright guys. And they all say that what you come away with is not someone who's carried away with himself. It is someone who is really haunted by failure, by the possibility it could all blow up, but he takes the wrong options. They said, why does he go into Russia? He said, Look, don't, don't go in, boss. You know, you're not the man you used to be. And he said, that's exactly why I've got to do it. I'm not well. You know, some kind of funny disease killed my father and my uncle. That's the same thing that's killing me. I haven't got long left. I've got a baby son. There's going to be a long regency here. I've got to go into Russia and thump Alexander because he's the only guy with an army left that can stop me. And if I don't sort him out for my son, it's going to be, it's not going to work. So I've got to do it now. You know, it's, a, it's driven by by completely different things. So sort of Alexander was helping him in the blockade against Britain and then came out of it. And he knows that what, while Alexander was in there, that blockade was working. He's got to get him back into it. You know, and he's got to defeat Alexander's army so that the British don't have anything to sub. You know, he's driven by fear, I think, and apprehension on the one hand. On the other hand, he thinks that if he gets his act together, he can do it. 
So that's, you know, it's an interesting mindset. Yeah, that's a br- I mean, yeah, and, and of course, he wants to leave something. I mean, in the and I'm, I'd never thought I'd use Vin Diesel uh, in a thing with um, with uh, Napoleon. But in the words of Fast and Furious, it's all it's all about family. And this is he's trying to he's he's trying to make. I bet he didn't think I'd get to use that as a quote in, a, in Napoleon thing. But that is that is a, he's trying to farm a dynasty. He's trying to far, to, to 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 have a line, almost as you like a line a, a lineage. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, the, that, the dynasty is very important to him because, again, it's actually, I think it's fear. You know, it's uncertainty. And the guy's not a fool. And he says, look, what happens after me? You know, I'm a one-man band. These guys, don't forget, are steeped in classical history. You know, the, these guys know their Roman history. They know what, you know, what, what happens when, when the big guy goes down. There's chaos. Um, you know, the generals, my marshals will all be fighting for the empire. It'll all fall apart. But if I have a legitimate heir, everyone will rally to him. You know, everyone will back that kid. And so I've got that's the only way we're going to continue is if I have an heir, which is why divorce of Josephine is somebody he really loves, you know, to, to marry somebody who can give him a son, which happens. Um, and you know, from that point onwards, he thinks, it's secure, but it's only secure if I secure it. You know, I've got to, I've still got to win that battle. But he's he's thinking ahead once he's got his son. But where does the head lead him? It leads him into Russia. It's the it's the wrong option. Yeah, and perhaps it's because he is he is frightened. If I don't do this now, when will I do it? And that exactly. spurs him on. The the hundred days. I mean, we talk about knowing your Roman history, but this is something out of, out of you know, you could almost say, <laughs> isn't it? It really is. The Hundred Days is, is a roller coaster. Um, and, and it climaxes in probably the most famous battle it, it fought on, you know, pre First World War, probably one of the most famous battles fought, fought in Europe. Yeah. I mean, the Hundred Days, you could not make this up. You know, I mean, if, if, if you went to, um, I mean, I've been involved in, in making a movie about Napoleon recently. And I know if I went to one of these guys with this idea that Napoleon's career doesn't end at Russia, it doesn't end with Elba, it ends when he come, he has this dash, he comes back. They, they tell me that, you know, no, look, look, the public will never believe this. You know, this is too incredible. Yeah. But it actually is what he does. So, I mean, I was reading something the other day that says, you know, people nowadays – because of media, one thing or another, are we all? Do we all actually think we're actors in the movie of our own life? Well, it, it, I, I don't think it started with our generation. I think it started with him. <laughs> to, you know, to be, this is my life. I'll do what I want with yeah, it. Yeah. To be honest with you, to be honest with you, Michael, I think I am acting in the right. But unfortunately, I'm not. I'm not playing the romantic lead. I'm playing the you know the the, the best buddy who gets knocked off in the first scene in my life. I don't know how yours is going. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we won't go, we'll go there. But so, we'll you know, does it, I mean, are there forebodings when he comes up against Wellington? When, you know, because a Waterloo is, is an epic battle. It's an epic film from 1917. You said you'd be in, involved with the Absolutely. new one, which you can't wait to see. But is there, because it, it's such a long, it, it's such a long day. I mean, it ebbs and flows. And then finally, it's, it's those, it's those pesky, it's those pesky Prussians, isn't it, at the end? Yeah, I mean, the, the whole adventure was crazy. Uh, you know, the whole hundred days. And it's, it's interesting to see some of the guys who stuck with Napoleon through thick and thin, who, when it comes to the hundred days, say, you're nuts. You know, Mary Louise, his wife, who has backed him to the hilt in 1814, you know, risked life and limb for him, says, you're nuts. You know, no, you're crazy. You ruin everything for me. And he, he almost did. You know, his, his chief of staff, Berthier, Berthier is, 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 is Watson to his homes, his sidekick. You know, you're, you're crazy. You know, no, I'm not, not, I want nothing to do with this. Which means in Berthier, he's not got the man. He's got, got his organizer. Um, you know, he's like Blair without Mandelson. You know, this is Blair without Campbell. You know, this is what he is. This is what Berthier is to the guy. The thing is, Waterloo, I mean, is Wellington was the best judge of it. It was a near run thing. But what people forget, uh, and it's only sort of geeks like me know this kind of thing. Okay, if the French could have won at Waterloo, but Napoleon had thrown absolutely everything he had at it. And the French army was exhausted. Um, a very good historian of Waterloo, uh, a chap called Hersey, English chap, who said that, you know, look, any Prussian 
or British formation that was half organized would have caught what was left of the French. Even if that hadn't happened, only geeks like me know this. You know, there's an army of 180,000 battle-hardened elite Russian troops stationed in eastern France on the borders there, around about Strasbourg way. If, if, if they would have got him. Yeah. They would have just marched on Paris and it would have been over. The Russians didn't fire a shot. That's you know, they, fascinating. I, I, it, it was hopeless. Yeah. So even I mean even if even if Napoleon had won Waterloo he that is the it is the, the it would have been the original Fyrick victory i.e. what was left of an exhausted uh, you know Grand Armée would have been would have been cleaned up pretty quickly by any of the above you know p- you know yeah. pick a pick a force basically yeah yeah I mean the, he'd already beaten the Prussians the day before Waterloo at Vav, and he thought the Prussians were completely out of the game. Uh, this is a, a instruct, an illustrative of what he was up against. He thought the Prussians were out of the game. He'd beaten them. All he had to do was take on Wellington. If that had been the case, he'd have beaten Wellington. But the Prussians were reinforced and regrouped within hours. They were slow moving, but they got there just in time. Yeah. You know, um, I think the person, if, if Napoleon had won at Waterloo, uh, the person who, whose life would have changed would have been Wellington. You know, Wellington's career was made in India and it was largely made in Spain. He yep. never faced Napoleon. If he faced Napoleon and lost, I don't think Wellington would have gone on to have the glittering future he did. Um, but but Napoleon would have been got anyway, which makes you wonder why on earth he did it. Because, again, but you, I think it's just, is it is it that going out in a blaze of glory? And if he knew that that was, you know, if he knew that... Uh, at the very best, exile awaited him, or if not execution, uh, then you know you might as well go down, go down on the, with the, with the plan. You know, trying to trying to keep to the plan, or trying to, you know, this one last throw the dice. I think that I think there's a lot in that, Giles. I mean, you know, if you're going to go under, go down fighting. There is a chance. I think he always thinks too, though. There is a chance if I do defeat them and throw a scare into them, uh, the coalition might fall apart. You know, if I beat the English and the Prussians, maybe they'll pull out. The Austrians don't want to fight. Are the Russians going to take me on alone? Alexander's already grumbling. I'm 3,000 miles from home. What am I doing here? This is costing me money. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing was he was always afraid on Elba that the Allies were going to renege on the deal. The Austrians didn't want him on Elba. The British didn't want him on Elba. The Prussians didn't want him on Elba. It was, it was Alexander who said, be fair to him. Because they did like each other. And Napoleon's always afraid that sooner or later, the Prussians and the British are going to win the argument and they're going to send me to St. Helena anyway. Mm. So I may as well chance my arm. And he is getting reports from his, from his friends in France that, look, the Bourbons are unpopular. All you have to do is walk back. Yeah. And if it yeah. was just a question to France, there is, there is mileage in that argument because it did collapse like a house of cards. And there's arguments about a house of board bond that goes, I mean, that's got repercussions to Europe even today. I'm going to run out of time, damn, and blast it. Uh, but <laughs> just the fact that you've got, you've got hold of correspondence, that's got to be, that's got to be worth its weight in gold to, if, you, if you're reading the correspondence between Napoleon and his marshals. That must be quite something. Yeah, it is. I mean, the, the, between Napoleon and his marshals is really worth reading on a whole number of levels. Um, you know, sometimes it's like reading somebody's hex. Mm. You know, he's firing <laughs> off SNSs all the time to people and says, you know, don't go here, go there. I haven't heard from. One of the best things you get is if some of the marshals who are a bit un- disorganized, it's, you know, where the hell are you? you know, <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah. You know, I'm not telling you to do anything. I'm telling you to tell me what you're doing. Where and this is the you? thing about history, you? isn't it? Because people think it's all grand proclaimments, you know, from on high. Yeah. But it isn't. It's like, where you should you should have been here three days ago. Where the, are you? No, well, that's exactly it. Or three hours ago or something. Or, you know, you don't even know where you're supposed to be. How do I? You know, <laughs> and you can, finally, you'll get a message back. How do I? How can I tell you? I don't know where I am. I'm, I'm here in two days. I don't know where I am. You know what I mean? It's that sort of thing. What? Uh, you mentioned the film, by the way, because we've got lots to look forward to in this year, isn't it? With uh, Wacking uh, Phoenix. Uh, as that's as right now, that's going to be an interesting, wasn't it? I mean, I, I, I will, you know, I'll be there with my textbooks. Uh, it's going to. You're looking forward to because it, it is it is about the time because we do seem to see to see again 
history is written mainly by the victors, you know, uh, Boney was a warrior, etc., etc. All going back to those those uh, those nursery rhymes, you know, and Welling- and, the, and, the, and the myth, the legends of Wellington. It'll be good to get a, a balanced look at Napoleon finally in film, perhaps. Oh yeah, I mean, I'm, it was. I haven't had as much fun in my whole life as I did working with those people. They're amazing people. They're wonderful. Uh, one of the things you got to remember: you're making a movie. You know, you want to entertain people, but you don't want it to be completely, you know, off the wall. You want it to be grounded in reality, which it is. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's, it's I, I had incredible amount of fun. I, I learned a lot from them, um, as much as they did from me. It's, and it's great to see there's still such interest in all this. Because it is a big subject. Yeah, but you see, no. as as a, as a as a small boy reading history, when you look at the Napoleon, if you look at the lineup of forces during the Napoleonic Wars, it's just glittering and it's fabulous. And I know war is a dirty business, but my goodness, you got lancers, you got hussars, you got dragoons, you got all sorts coming in from left, right, and centre. I mean, it really is colourful and complex, and it's sh- and it shapes Europe that we have today. Yeah, it does in uh, in all sorts of ways. I mean, Napoleon creates his own myth on Saint Helena that everybody buys into. And we're still living with that. You know, that influences the film. It influences everything. But if you look at daily life in continental Europe, and this is where, say, being British, um, you know, it's a bit difficult to make people understand, um, you know, because of the civil code, which he always said would be his most lasting achievement. It's true. You know, it's pretty much in existence in most European countries. You know, um, buying and selling a house, you know, getting married or something in France, Spain, Italy, Germany, Poland, it's all pretty much the same. And it's because of that, you know, um, after World War II, when Europe was on its knees and they were just getting what was then um, the European the economic community off the ground um, at local level, below the politicians, you know, local administrators in France and Germany and Italy they could talk to each other because they were all basically the Napoleonic administrative system. You know, you get you and you get legal dealings between European countries. It's still the code. The court system's pretty much the same. Indeed. You know, you Michael, can't. I'm going to have to cut. I've only got 30 seconds left before we go to the news. The book is called Napoleon, The Decline of Fall of an Empire. We could have talked about this for most of the rest of the day. It's by Michael Burroughs. Michael, if people want to find you online, do you do the online thing? Is there a website? Sorry, are you on? Are you online? Is there a website they can people can find no, you? No, I don't have a website, Charles. I'm sorry. It's okay. The book, the book will be available as a virtual download, though. The book is called Napoleon: Decline and Fall of an Empire. It's by Michael Burroughs. Michael, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to chat Napoleon with you today. Charles, it's been brilliant. Thank you so much.